what venue it may come. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm excited about today's message. Oh, watch out. Holy Ghost coming now. Praise God. That's a miracle. <laughs> Praise God. I know it long enough I can say that. Praise God. Um, I believe that we're living in the last days, and I believe that God is firing us up. Now, I, I want to say this before I get in my message. You know, um, God is always faithful. God is always faithful. Come on, wake up from the dead. Wake, rise up from the dead, you dead bones. Come on. God is always faithful. Amen. Come on now. God is always faithful. Hallelujah. Amen. And I want you to know this morning that um, a couple of things that, as Linda was saying about the prayer meeting that's been taking place. God's been moving. And uh, I don't know if you're moving, but I know God's moving. And uh, I'll tell you, the Lord has impressed me uh, this past week to give up my two jobs, my jobs at the uh, security place, at the yacht club. Uh, because it's just taken too much out of me, I get home at 1.30, quarter or 2, by the time I get to sleep, and the next day I'm just dead. I can't, I'm good for nothing. And the Lord said, that's not what I called you for. So he said, give it up. And I'm giving it up. I'm turning it in. And I know that God will provide because he's my Jehovah Jireh. Amen. Amen. That our brother prayed. He is our Jehovah Jireh. And I don't really need the money that bad. Uh, so praise God. Amen. Amen. I want to give myself more to the work of God. Amen. Amen. So uh, we're going to be doing some things in the near future that's going to rock the boat. Remember that song back in the 70s, Rock the Boat? Don't tip the boat over. I'm going to tip the boat over. Amen. No, I'm not going to be doing any of this stuff. Praise God. Amen. Title of my message this morning is this. It's time to cut some heads off. Now, I want to clarify that. And before I do, I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you up there in Maine. God bless you, Brother Sajeev in India and anyone else who may be watching this morning. But it's time to cut some heads off. And I want to uh, bring a, 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 uh, a, uh, just a, a disclaimer, if I can. Before someone takes this out of context and said, oh boy, Brother Bob, Pastor Bob has gone to be an Islamic extremist. He wants to cut heads off now. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about cutting someone's head off in the natural. I'm talking about cutting some heads off in the spiritual. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to kind of just go along a little bit. A lot of you know this story. You grew up in Sunday school and you know the story of uh, David and Goliath. But I got some good nuggets for you this morning. hope that will cause you to grow in Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, you know the story it begins where uh, the Philistines were in... Uh, were in uh, opposition to Israel and they were going into battle and they were... Uh, on the mountainside, they were on one mountainside, and Israel was on the other mountainside. There was a valley in between them. And you know, they, they were getting ready to fight. And so they began fighting, and then all of a sudden, what happened was, is that the uh, Philistines decided to send in their secret weapon. And that secret weapon, you know, was Goliath. And now some commentators say that Goliath was a little bit over nine feet tall. He was of the giants. Other commentators says he was around seven foot, but it doesn't matter. Six cubits in a span roughly was about nine feet. That's a pretty big dude. You know, that's somebody like if, if, if even if I was to stand before, a, who was that wrestler? The one with the blonde hair. Hulk, Hulk Hogan, right? You ever see him stand next to some people? They look like little pencils, you know what I mean? And I probably look like a little pencil next to him, you know? Uh, but, I, I, but you know, I understand that Goliath was a lot bigger than Hulk Hogan. Okay. And so he was out there. He was their champion. And he was named Goliath. And he was a strong dude. Won many, many battles. But how many know that that which is natural is first, but then that which is spiritual? Amen. Come on, somebody. 
that which is natural than that which is spiritual. And some of us in this place and some of us watching this morning, we have some giants in our lives. And these giants are sin and things that we have so accepted over the years. And Linda mentioned something about that. Something five years ago we would never do or think or say or watch. We're doing it today. We've kind of let our God down and they've become giants in our, in, our, in our land. And God's saying, no, 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 you need to take some heads off of these giants in your life. And so here you see uh, they're, they're going about and they're, they're getting ready to fight. And uh, uh, the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. He is coming against God. He's coming against God's army. He's saying, I'm defying you. You ain't going to whip me. You ain't going to beat me. And sometimes the devil will say that to you. You may be in the situation, circumstances going through your life right now. It may be whatever it is, unbelief, it may be fear, it may be doubt, it may be uh, some other sin that you're so caught up in. But God's saying to you, listen, don't worry about that. Keep your eyes on me. Hallelujah. And so here, even though the enemy is rising up and saying all of these negative things and saying all these things about the army of the Lord, something took place among the people. And when verse 11 in 1 Samuel 17 says this, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now I remember some of you would, would tell us, and you've seen what's been happening on Monday. We've been Fasting, we've been praying and coming together in prayer. And the first thing that happens is the enemy gets upset. I know Sister Jen had a, a situation happen in her home. And then all of a sudden, Brother Jesse breaks his leg. Come on, somebody. And the enemy's trying to discourage us and trying to discourage us not to continue in prayer not to continue in fasting not continuing in sinking his face one of the biggest lies the enemy gives is that, is that a megaphone voice of his echoes in our spirit is prayer is a waste of time I want you to know prayer is not a waste of time everything outside of prayer is a waste of time come on it says that they were dismayed. And that word dismayed means they were broken down. They were on the verge of a nervous breakdown. That's what the Hebrew word means. Confusion and fear and terrifying attitudes prevailed. They were greatly afraid. I want you to know that there were times people told me that... Uh, when they first got saved, that as they were coming to the Lord and getting closer to the Lord, the devil would tell them, I'm going to take your kids out. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill this one. I'm going to do this. I'm going to cause harm. If you get any closer, I'm going to do all this. He's a liar and the father of lies. And you need to cut that devil's head off. You need to cut that head off. And then all of a sudden, as they're cowering in fear, as they're back there uh, trembling, confused, and broken down, it just so happens that David's father, Jesse, sends him to go bring food to his brothers. Now, David was just a little lad, you know. Not too important. And I want you to understand this morning that you don't have to be a spiritual giant in order to kill your Goliaths. David was not a spiritual giant. He had failures and things just like everyone else. But the one thing he did know was who his God was. And so David comes on the scene. You know all this, but I'm just trying to bring this to a, to a point here. He comes on the scene and he sees his grown-up brothers and the king of Israel, Saul, 
hiding behind a rock, cowering, fearful, trembling, breaking down, confused. And he goes there and he, he says, now understand, he's only a young man. He says, what, what, what's going on? Why are you so fearful? And then he makes this statement, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Amen. Last Wednesday and the Wednesday before, we learned about covenant relationships. Uncircumcised Philistine means that who is this, this person that is not in covenant relationship with God? Who is this Satan that is not in covenant with God any longer? Who are his demons that are not in covenant with relationship with God anymore? Who is that uncircumcised Philistine? Come on, somebody. You can name the things that are in your life that have been pondering on you and pounding on you and pounding on you. And you can't seem to get rid of that thing that's been hindering you, been taking advantage of you. And I'm here to tell you today, who is that uncircumcised thing in your life that's not in covenant with God? And so... Saul says to David, he says, who are you? You're a young man. You, you haven't been to war. And he says, well, let me tell you about the bear that I killed. Let me tell you about the lion that I killed. In fact, the bear had, had a, 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 a sheep, a lamb right in his mouth. I went right there and took it by the beard. I killed that thing. So Saul says to him, okay, he says, if you want to go, go. He says, but put my armor on. You can't go in the strength of man. You can't go in the strength of another person's armor. You can't go in mommy and daddy's armor. You can't go in brother and sister so-and-so's armor. You can't go in pastor's armor. You got to go in your own armor. And the Bible says that God gave us, hallelujah, in Ephesians, weapons of our warfare. He gave us the helmet of salvation. Hallelujah. The breastplate of righteousness. Our feet shall with the preparation of the gospel. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. He gave us the shield of faith, which will quench every fiery dot of the enemy. He's given us the armor that, we, that fits us. It's not something that we cannot handle. It's not something that we cannot use. He said, casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down. Come on, somebody say pulling down. The pulling down of strongholds. If you've got a stronghold in your life, let me tell you, you have the power and the anointing of God because you're in covenant relationship with him. So David took off that armor and said, Saul, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't. I haven't proved these. I have not been able to use these. So David goes out. This is very interesting, by the way. David goes out and he chooses five stones out of a brook. Now, I heard some commentators say this. They said, he must have doubted God. He didn't take one stone, he took five. But can I tell you the reason I believe he took the five? We'll get into it a little bit. Hallelujah. Because Goliath had four brothers. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He only needed one stone for Goliath, but he had four more stones for each brother that would try to come and take their place. Take his place. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? When you kill one giant, there are going to be some more coming after you. 
Because the devil don't give up real easy. He's going to come and tempt you in another way, another fashion, you know. And, and I remember uh, the story of this one man I, I read about in counseling. Uh, you don't know who he is, and he was not from around here, so I can say, I can say the, t- you know, the testimony of this man. This man had a problem with pornography. And every day when he walked home from work, he would pass by the X-rated movie theater. And then he'd go to the pastor and he'd say, Pastor, he says, I, I, I'm just ready to give up. I, I, cannot, I cannot get victory over this thing. You know, it's, it's, it's been a stronghold, a stronghold on my life. I can't get over it. And he said, well, tell me your routine. Tell me what you do. He says, well, every morning, you know, I walk to work. You know, my wife takes the car, and I walk to work. He says, but on the way home, he says, I always walk by that, that, that stinking X-rated movie theater. He says, and that spirit just kind of draws me and pulls me in there, and I go in there, and I sin. And the pastor counseling him said, well, he says, I'm going to be honest with you. He says, you want to be in there. He said, what? He said, you want to be in there. You like being in there. Your flesh wants to be in there. And he said, Pastor, no, I'm coming for you for help. He says, I'm coming and asking you for help. He says, you don't want my help. He says, you don't need my help. He said, well, what am I supposed to do? He says, walk home a different way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Walk home a different way. I believe it was Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. You'll never get a different result if you keep doing it all the same way. Keep going the same way. You want the victory, but guess what? You keep doing the same thing you're doing. You're not going to get the victory. So David chooses five stones. Everybody said five is a number of grace, and I understand all that. But he chose the five stones. Hallelujah. For a future battle. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Come on, answer me. For a future battle. You're not going to defeat Satan one time. It's going to be many times. He comes and he's a relentless pursuer. He'll pursue you and and your thoughts. He'll pursue you and enticing you and seducing you and getting you away from the same convictions that when you remember when you were a Christian, when you first got saved. Remember that zeal that you had. Remember that hunger that you had. Remember that desire that you had. Well, God doesn't want you to lose that. God wants you to still have that. And I've heard preachers say, well, that's because you now you're moving into faith. I don't believe that. I believe that God wants you to keep your zeal. I believe God wants wants you to keep your convictions. I believe that God wants you to continue on on fire for him. Hallelujah. I remember reading in the Bible about the temple of God and and the lamp would never go out. They said, you keep that light burning. Keep that fire burning. Hallelujah. Don't let it go out. And they would would have people come and, 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 and light, keep, make sure that that lamp inside the, temple was continuously lit all the time. Can I tell you, make sure the light, that lamp that's in your temple right here, make sure that light is in your, that temple right here. Make sure that light is always lit. Don't let it go out. Don't let it go out for no one, no thing, no fame, no fortune. Don't let it go out for anything. Don't let the world crash upon you and take that light and snuff it out. Don't let a person take that light and snuff it out. It ain't worth it. Because when you go to heaven. And you see all that God has for you. Hallelujah. You say God has stuff for me in heaven. Oh absolutely. The Bible says eye hath not seen. Ear has not heard. Neither has it entered into our, our little pea brains. The things that God has prepared. For those that love him. Hallelujah. Your eye has not even seen. If you've seen the most beautiful thing in this world. Your ear the most Beautiful sound are in your mind. Cannot compare to the things that God has prepared for you, who are those of you who will endure to the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so David, 
goes and he one thing I love about this story a lot of us fear the devil remember they were afraid right what did fear do to them it paralyzed them Fear caused them to cover over and hide in fear and trembling and confusion. That's what fear does. But David ran toward Goliath. Come on, somebody. Come on. You got to run toward your Goliath. Don't run from your Goliath because you ain't going to outrun him. That thing is going to pursue you and continue to take you down the road that you don't want to really go down. And David pursued that thing. He said, oh, yeah? He said, you uncircumcised Philistine and because, you know, uh, Goliath was starting to look at him, saw, saw him come running. He said, are you, am, I, am I a dog? Am I a dog? You give this little puny guy over here to fight me? And he started to curse David's God. That's exactly what the devil does. He curses, God, uh, he curses our God. He began to defy David and his God. And rather than David, fearful and all hiding and confused, David stands up and he says, you come to me with swords and spears. Come on, somebody. He says, but I'm coming in the name of the Lord my God. I'm coming in the name of my God. I want you to know that there's strength, there's power, there's anointing in the name of Jesus. We sang that song this morning about the blood. You don't hear about the blood too much anymore in churches. It is the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It is the blood that gives healing. It is the blood that gives deliverance. It was his life that he gave on that cross that got us the victory. Hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> victory is mine. We sing that song. Victory is mine. How I told Satan to get thee behind. That's what you got to do, hallelujah, every single day when your feet hit the floor. And I love what David Diamond says. Every morning when he gets up, he gives the devil diarrhea. That devil just looks at him and says, oh, my God, David's awake again. Is that the testimony you have? Instead of you being all fearful and nervous about the devil and what he's doing, are you getting up and are you a threat to the kingdom of darkness? Is your light so shining, hallelujah, out there that you're dispelling darkness wherever you go? You, you ever hear some people, they just, just mad at you for no reason? They treat you awful for no reason. That's not because of you. That's because of the light that's in you. That's because of Christ. He says, when they persecute you, they're persecuting me. Hello? Come on, somebody. When Saul, Paul, the apostle, was persecuting the church and Jesus revealed himself from heaven, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was persecuting the church. That's a close relationship, my friend. Come on. That's why you got to keep your tongue off of your brother and your sister. Uh-oh. Come on. Don't be talking about your pastor. Don't be talking about your churches. Come on, somebody. Well, if only they were like, if only he would, yep, watch it. See, I have one advantage. I have, I have the anointing of the ball man. In the Bible, remember the children went and made fun of the ball man, the prophet? I, I got that anointing. <laughs> See? So David runs down, he pursues, he puts that stone, that flat stone in his sling, and he begins to, I can see Goliath standing there with his sword, his armor, laughing at David. What a joke. Can I tell you, these are the, tech, 
These are the techniques the devil uses with you. Oh, what a joke. Oh, you think God's going to come to your rescue? You think he's going to come? You've been asking for a long time and you ain't got it. God's forsaken you. He don't love you. He's left you. Oh, your prayers are still not answered, are they? No. You know why? Because God don't love you. He don't hear your prayer. He don't care about you. That's what the devil uses, his techniques and his weapons. That's why you've got to take authority. You, I believe he took the fifth stone. Hallelujah. He got that thing going. Wham! That giant stood there, didn't know what hit him. I want you to know something. This thing gave him a concussion. That giant just, ooh, bang. Didn't, he was almost dead. Because the Bible says that when David went up to him, he stood on his chest, took out the sword of Goliath, and it says he killed him. So he wasn't quite dead yet. So he killed him, and then he did something else. He cut his head off. This is very interesting. Look at verse 54. It says, And David took the head of the Philistine, and he brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. I often wondered why. Now understand, Goliath had a pretty big head. Okay. Why would David drag this head dripping with blood and all kinds of stuff and take it and bring it to Jerusalem, which was several miles away. Why would he do that? In Ma in, uh, I believe it's Matthew. That Jesus was cruci uh, crucified in a place which was called Golgotha in the Hebrew. And in the Greek it means Calvarius or Calvary is derived in the Latin. That's where we get the word Calvary from. Golgotha means, all these words mean skull or place of the skull. And one belief suggests that it could be called skull because of what Scripture tells us in 1 Samuel 17, 54. Then David took the Philistine, Goliath's head, and brought it to Jerusalem. He put it, his weapons in his tent. 18 miles he brought that head. Could it be that they named this Jerusalem site Skull because it is where the head of Goliath was buried? There's so much research going on now about Golgotha. You know, the, you've seen the pictures in Jerusalem of the, mount, the side of the mountain that looks like a skull? I don't believe that's the place. Because if you go back to the Hebrew words, <laughs> listen to this. The name Goliath, according to the Bible, Goliath of Gath, is a name derived from the words Gola, Gatha, or Golgotha. Hello? One rabbi says, if you find 
the buried head of Goliath, you will find the very spot where Jesus was crucified. That which is in the natural, Goliath's head was taken on Calvary or Golgotha was the place where Satan's head was wounded and Satan got, I mean, Jesus got the victory. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Give me a hallelujah. Give me something. Hallelujah. Because it means, it means that. Golagatha is the two words that make up the name Goliath. Golgotha. And I believe it was later on in the uh, early uh, hundreds of centuries that they found this place and they, of the skull. And they said, oh, that's Golgotha because it looks like a skull. That's got to be the place. And so they put a fence around it and charged people money to go see it. Can I tell you, a lot of the places in Jerusalem today are not the original places. It's all tradition. It's all what they think. But as they're doing archaeological discoveries, you're going to find that, and I believe this because I've been doing some research on it, okay? I believe the Temple Mount is not where it's, they say it is, where the Golden Dome is. I believe that was Fort Antonio, the Roman fortress. But I believe that the Temple of Herod and the Temple of Solomon was located in the city of David. And as you read your Bible, you see that David purchased the threshing floor of Onan. He wanted to give it to him. He said, no, 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 I'm going to purchase it. And Solomon built the temple, his temple, on the threshing floor of Onan. And can I tell you, that threshing floor was in the city of David, not out on the mountain. Archaeological discoveries are coming to light. It's going to be very, very hard, though, because, you know, tradition, people that get so stuck. But the Bible says your tradition makes the word of God of none effect. When we come up with pure biblical archaeological discoveries that prove something, we got to hold to that. So David took the head of the Philistine, he brought it to Jerusalem, and he put it, his armor in his tent. Now, what about... The battles against the Philistines, giants again. Let me see if I can find that scripture. I had it written down, but I... Did I forget to put it down here? Once again, the... If you read the Bible, I'll get the reference for you another time. I, I don't have it right with me, but it's, it's there, believe me, trust me. And uh, It says, once again, the Philistines were at war with Israel. This is scripture, but I don't have the reference. I just have the, the verse. And when David and his men were in the thick of battle, maybe, Bobby, you can look it up for me. David became weak and exhausted. Ishbi Binab was one of the descendants of the giant. His, bron his bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword. He had, con he had cornered David and was about to kill him. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, came to David's rescue and killed the Philistine. Can I tell you something? When you begin to take authority... When you begin to start to slay some of the giants, it's contagious. When they begin to see victories in your life, when they begin to see you uh, confident, not in yourself, but confident in God, it's, it's catchy. And now, because David, this little weak little thing, don't ever think you need to be the strong, strong, strong Christian. You just come to Jesus in humility. David came in humility, and they saw David slay that giant and cut his head off. You know what that said? If he can do it in the name of the Lord, so can I. 
If he can have the victory in the Lord, so can I. Oh, come on, somebody. So can I. If he can have deliverance from the Lord, so can I. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that was the first one. After this, there were another battle against the Philistines at Gob. They fought Sibachai from Hushan. And he killed Seth, another descendant of the giant. Have you found it, Robert? Where is it? Yeah, I think that's it. Let me go over there. Second Samuel. What is it? 21? Yep, that's it. And then verse 18 says, And it came to pass after this that there was yet another battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of Giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistine, where Alanan, the son of Jarrah Obrim, the Bethlehemite slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there, verse 20, and there was yet a battle in Gath where was a man of great stature that had every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. Four and twenty in number, he also was born to the giant. And when he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimon, his brother of David, slew him. My point is this. When you kill one giant, there's more coming. Are you hearing me? When you kill one giant, there's more giants coming. And what happens when we face these things is we can become discouraged. And that is one of the tools the enemy will use in and through your life. If you allow him to. Now we all get discouraged. Does anyone here not get discouraged? Because if you say you don't get discouraged at any time in your life, we got to get that, that giant of lying out of you. Come on, somebody. We all get discouraged. Now we may not all get depressed. See, to be depressed is to be oppressed. We all get discouraged at times. But you don't let that discouragement turn into a giant. You don't let uh, discouragement or you don't let confusion or you don't let any of those weaknesses of fear come into your life and control you to the point where you won't even go down the road. Now see, one of the things I'm praying for Linda is she gets over the fear of going up that, that ramp near our house because that's where she had the accident. Someone came and back-ended her. She will not go down, up that ramp. She has fear. But that will open other doors if she doesn't get that right. And I'm praying, God, Monday nights, show her that fear. Get rid of that fear. Because a little bit of fear, you have a little root, a little seed, what's going to happen? It's going to grow, it's going to grow, it's going to grow. Do we have a natural fear? Yes. But I'm talking when it comes and it's not natural. not natural to drive your car down the road that's why we have a license I can see if we couldn't go down any roads then you know. don't let fear dominate your life people say to me all the time when I go to different foreign countries 
especially China when I was there. They said, be careful what you say because there may be plants, government plants. You have to be very careful. And they said, then weren't you fearful of losing your life? And the answer is, yeah, I don't want to lose my life, but I'm not going to stop not doing what God said to do. Hello? When I go to India, aren't you afraid to go to India? In the, in the natural, yeah. I mean, who wants to go to India? You know, everybody thinks it's glamorous. It's not glamorous. Being a missionary is not glamorous. It's hard. You got 12 hour difference in time. Think about that. We got three hour difference and everybody's falling apart. You know, from California, you come over here, three hour difference. Oh my gosh, it's like you, you lost the world. You go back one hour in time, in daylight savings, everybody's thrown off. Come on. My point is this. Don't let the devil stop you in whatever God has for your life. Don't let him talk you out of it. Oh, I, I, I can't do that. Oh, 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 I, I can't do that. Maybe you need healing. Maybe you need deliverance. God gave you a free will, and that, yet you can't exercise that free will. Something's wrong. I, I couldn't go on a mission field. Yes, you could. The Great Commission's for everybody. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. Don't let the devil rob you of a blessing. Think for a moment of your own situations. I can take for an example Illusion Milan. Back in Haiti. A place that they lived all of their life deciding to come to America not knowing where they're going not knowing what could happen did that stop them? no they're here this morning that didn't stop them I'm sure there was some fear there, some uncertainty. But I remember Milan saying that she believed when she was in prayer, God told her to come, right? But now it takes the act of faith to believe what God said and get up off your couch, make things in order, and then go. This morning, there's some heads that God wants to cut off in your life. There's some Goliaths that seem to be holding you back. Stopping you from going forward. Can I tell you, the devil knows all the logic and philosophies and ideologies of the world. If you don't think so, go to, about, go to college, you'll see. Strong Christians that have gone to to colleges have come out atheist because of the philosophies and ideologies that these professors have. And they instill in people. And the devil uses them to sow the seed of doubt in their minds. Can I tell you something? If I have a friend and the friend says to me, listen, I don't want nothing to do with your God. I don't want to hear nothing about your God. I like you as a person, but I don't want to hear nothing about your God. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, I'm sorry, but we cannot be friends any longer. You're cursed. See, we don't take it serious. We don't take it serious. We think we're going to change them. You ain't going to change a squirrel. You'll never change them. Only God can change them. 
but they're not going to be my buddy, buddy, and I'm not going to be walking with them, and I'm not going to be going to the places that they go to. Hello? I already slayed some of those giants. Well, if only you would identify and just have a couple of drinks, you know, then I would be open to your God. Don't you listen to that lying devil. He wants to entrap you and snare you. Oh, if I only try that marijuana just once. Come on. Some people say, well, marijuana is not addicting. Oh, yes, it is. I know Debbie knows a little bit about that. If you're concerned about uh, marijuana and being addictive, go talk to her. Over 20 years. Hear me now, over 20 years, every day. Am I exaggerating? Day and night for 20 years. It's a miracle she's sitting here in her right mind. And that's not an exaggeration. Every day. The devil wants to trip you up and think that you're different. You can, you can let this go and let that go. And you can have sex out of marriage. And you can do all of these things. And what's going to happen when you come home pregnant? Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, one of the hardest things to do today is be a parent. Some of you, I'm going to tell you the truth right now. Some of you didn't get a hold of your kids. Come on. They're telling you what to do. They're telling you what they're going to do. Hello? Hello? Can I tell you, you're going to stand before God and you're going to give an account for that. Hello? I didn't get one amen, Sister Ann. You're going to, st this is serious business. It's the soul of your children. The devil is lying to them, and you are buying into that lie, and you're allowing that giant to rule in your home by letting your children tell you what to do? Or your husband? Or your wife? I told Linda a long time ago, I said, honey, I love you, but you'll never take me away from God. If you backslide, I'll never, I'll never give up Jesus for you. You ain't worth it. <gasps> what? That's right. She's not worth my eternal salvation. She ain't worth backsliding, taking me with her to hell. She ain't worth it. No person's worth that. I'll tell you the truth because I love you. God's not happy with some of you because you allow giants to rule your life. And it's time today to cut the head off some of these giants. Come on, somebody. We've used the philosophy and the ideologies of the world and the, the, the wisdom of Satan to try to do God's will. It never will happen. You cannot fight him with the wisdom of this world because the wisdom of this world, according to the Bible, is devilish. It's demonic. Psychology will tell you, don't push your child. Don't push him because, you know, you're going to push him away. That's the philosophy of the world, not of the Bible. The Bible says, spare not the rod. That doesn't mean you hit them with a rod. But you discipline them. If I had a child that wouldn't come under my authority and they were underage, you know what I would do? I heard this before. I heard this philosophy and it's of the devil. Well, you can't force them. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You know how you force them? 
You take away all their privileges, all of them. You know what that teaches them? To respect your authority. To respect your authority as the parent. That you care enough for them and you love them enough to give them discipline. And let them know that they're not going to walk over your authority. That's what the devil does. He walks over authority. He did that with God and God kicked him out of heaven. I was talking with Bishop Towns was here last Wednesday. I was talking with him. We had lunch, and I was talking with him, and he said he's having a problem with his son. You know, the one that one time came and played the keyboard, sang beautifully? Well, he met this girl, heathen, in college, in college, and began to question whether God was real didn't know if God was real anymore. And so he got tied up with this girl. So his father brought him out of college because he's paying for it. But he's still connected with the girl. She's living in Jersey. He's living in California. And this is something that Bishop told me. And I, I looked at him for a moment. He said this to me. He said, I told my son, if you turn your back on God, we will no longer have contact with you as your parents. And when he first told me that, I said, man, that's harsh. In my flesh, I said, that, man. That. But then God spoke to me and said, remember the prodigal son? The father didn't go have any contact with him. The father didn't go rushing off to have lunch with him. The father didn't go over to see him. He didn't go over and rescue him. That's the problem. We have a, a baby mentality today where we want to rescue everything. Instead of letting the process take its course. And when God spoke that scripture to me, I said, now I understand God. I understand. And I said, brother, I said, that's a hard thing to do. But I said, I'm with you. I, I agree with you. He told his son, if you turn your back on, he said, and, he, and Bishop looked at me eyeball, eyeball. He said, do you know how serious that is? We don't take that serious. He's turning his back on God. Where he grew up as a little child in that, in that environment. Went to Sunday school, did the music, played worship, was on the worship team. All of those things he was doing. And he told him, he said, son, the devil's lying to you. Telling you can go your own way and do your own thing. Come on, somebody. And Monday night prayer, that's what we're doing. We're saying to God, God, this flesh is no good. This flesh has to come under subjection to you. That's where revival, revival doesn't stop by some evangelist hanging a sign outside the church that says revival tonight. That's not revival. No man can bring revival. I don't care if it's the assemblies of God. I don't care if it's church of God. I don't care what it is. No denomination can bring revival. Only God brings revival. Revival, when men seek them in prayer and repent of their sins and of their fleshliness that goes on in church. That's when revival starts because we are the church, not a building or denomination. We are the church. And when we take the heads of giants off in our life, that's coming to the altar and saying, God, forgive me. I've been doing it my way, but I'm going to do it your way. Forgive me, Lord, for trying to out psychologically take the advantage over you, God, by trying to do it man's ways, trying to do it my way. Come on, somebody. You got to do it God's way. I'm talking about your own life. I'm not talking about someone else. What are some of the things that you still allow in your life that's still hanging on to you? Some of the things that you do that is displeasing to God. Where is your conviction the conviction that you had when you were first converted. 
when you loved God and you were like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm born again, I'm brand new. But yet you've allowed things to creep into your life. That's the devil. Anything, anything that rears up its ugly head in your life that you give more attention to than God is an idol and a f- demon. God saying, there's victory here this morning. There's victory here this morning if you will take out the sword of the Lord that he has given you. And you begin to slay the giants, hallelujah, in your house. How many ever saw the movie War Room? Remember the girl when she met with the older lady and she said, you need to take authority in your home? What did she do? She went in her house. She started walking through her house. She said, no more Satan. Are you going to ha- get be in my house? She opened the door. She said, you get out of my house. Can I tell you, we, we walk in the natural so much. We do things routinely every day. We get up, go to the fridge. Or we get up, go to the bathroom, wash our hands, hopefully. Go to the fridge. Sit down, eat, watch. The TV goes on automatically. I made a new rule in my house. TV don't go on until after 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Unless you're watching a Christian video. Who? That's right. Why? If you can feed yourself, and that was me. I'm talking about me. Fox News in the morning. No more. No more. Oh, I ain't got time to read my Bible, Pastor. I ain't got time. But you can sit in front of Fox for two hours. Listen about Trump. And it's the same thing over and over and over again. I ain't got no time to read the Bible. I ain't got no time for prayer. I ain't got no time for seeking God early in the morning. Will I rise up and seek thee, the Bible says. Yeah, we let every influence and every person dictate to us what we believe. When deep down in our hearts and in our spirit, there's a longing, there's an emptiness. Oh, God, help me to reveal this today. God, there's an emptiness inside of you. There's something hungering after God inside of you. And there's something that you want more than anything and you can't put your finger on it. Can I tell you, I know what it is. It's the Holy Ghost. It's God himself, and he's trying to get your attention and draw you even closer. Why? Because there's coming more giants down the road. If you think you're having a hard time believing now, wait. Because the devil knows his time is short. Are you hearing me? The devil knows his time is short. And he's going to come any way he can to distract you. Can I tell you right now, I don't want to scare anybody. But can I tell you right now, there are witches in New Bedford. There are covens in New Bedford that meet and have blood sacrifices to destroy the Christians and their faith. Do you realize that? Do you understand that they took a survey and they found that Providence and New Bedford were the two cities that read the Bible the least. And you have a problem reading God's word and wonder why? It's a spiritual thing. It's not a natural thing. It's a spiritual thing. Come on, somebody. That devil don't want you to read this word because he doesn't want you to know your God. He doesn't want this word in you because it'll hide in your heart and that you might not sin against him. Devil don't want that. No, he wants you in front of the tube. Oh, if we could only watch Father that knows best. Maybe God will speak to our hearts. Father does know best.
I'm going to continue preaching the truth. Some of you may not like me anymore, but that's okay. Some of you may leave, and that's okay. If it comes to the point we have to close the church, we close the church. But I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to tell you because I love you. This is real love, my friend. I'm going to tell you the truth because I love you. And you can get mad at me all you want to, but you still have to love me. You can't go home without loving me. (laughs) I'm going to preach the truth to you. Oh, how we need truth in the pulpit today. Can I tell you there's so much going on in the pulpits today? It's sickening. Okay, they're talking about all kinds of weird things and crazy things and quantum worship and all kinds of garbage. It's a new age. Yet hundreds and thousands of Christians around the world are falling for this new quantum worship. If you haven't, type it in Google and you'll see what it is. Quantum worship, you have, to, you have to enter into a new dimension. It's new age. I know it's new age. And then what happens is you get three or four words, and you say three or four words over and over and over again. That opens the door for quantum worship. That's almost like transcendental meditation. You know how you get into worship with God? Clean hands and a pure heart. You know why people sit here with their arms folded during worship? You know why they don't stand up when when worship comes? You know why they don't lift their hands when worship comes? Because their soul is dead. Their spirit man is dead. Dead as a doornail. I don't care what you, I don't care how many words you speak in tongues. I don't care how many goosebumps and ducky bites you get. You can't stand up and worship God. Something's wrong with your batteries. Your battery's dead. Oh, no. Oh, if we want that new dress or we want that new thing, and we'll stand in a line of 20 people. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you the truth. You want them shoes? You know those shoes you saw? Huh? At DW? You know, you see the big, long line, or you go to Rentham Outlet, and you see the big, long line in the store. You'll stand there because you want them shoes. But you can't stand and worship and praise God. You can't lift your hands and praise God. Oh, oh. Say, oh, Pastor, my my arms are too sore. I can't raise my arms. How many want a $1,000 bill? I'll take it. (laughs) That arm will shoot up so fast. Woo, I'll take it. Hallelujah. can't go to church this morning. Can't go. Sister Annie, I can't go to church this morning. Can't go to church this morning. Uh, hello? What? You want to take me on a cruise? I'll be ready this afternoon. <laughs> but can't go to church this morning. Oh, I got aches and pains. Oh, oh, I'm, I, oh I can't. Let me tell you something. I got aches and pains too. And it's not Linda. I got aches and pains too. I mean, look at my fingers. My fingers are all crooked. I have arthritis. Did I still play? I still lift my hand. I banged it the other day. Bob saw it on the mailbox. Oh, such pain. I didn't even cuss either. You're going to think that's going to stop me? You think the devil's going to stop me? You don't know how many times he comes to me and says, why don't you just close the church? Those people don't care about you. He said, when's the last time somebody invited you over for dinner? Been a long time. Hello? When's the last time someone called you for prayer? That's been a long time. What am I here for? Just to preach a nice little sermon so you can go, go home? Come on, somebody. You don't think I get discouraged? I do. But then I tell the devil, I say, listen, devil. It don't matter if they invite me over for dinner. 
It don't matter if they call me for prayer. That's not why I'm here. That's one of the reasons I am here, but not the main reason. The main reason I'm doing what God said to do. So as long as there's people in this place that can support the ministry, guess what? We'll be here. But I'm not letting the devil rule and reign over my thoughts. See, here's the difference. We have a lot of carnality of Christianity today. Don't go by these big churches of a thousand members. Don't go by these big churches you see on television for an hour. That's all you see is an hour. Go spend some time and see how they live. Can I tell you, I know certain people that go to one of the largest churches in this area and they're living together. They're out boozing it up on Saturday night, dancing in the clubs. Hello? And yet they want to call themselves Christians? Let me tell you something. You hang around with the devil, you're going to get his character. What you once got delivered from, you'll go back to. I'm telling you from personal experience, when I backslid many, 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 many years ago, I went back to the same thing that I had been delivered from, and I went back even harder and, far, and farther. And cried out to God, and cried out to God for deliverance, and cried out to God. And I'll never forget this, never forget this. I was in my apartment on Holly Street, and I was living with a girl. Now, understand now. See, I can tell you experience. I'm not telling you some book thing. I was living with my girlfriend, and I was miserable, Debbie. You know, when you get surrounding happiness, but you're not happy inside, I had no happiness, no joy. I had backslidden from God, turned my back on God. Almost got killed, too, by the way. Car almost rear-ended me, and I almost got killed. Another time I was on the highway, and I was driving in the high-speed lane, and something inside of me, I was backslidden. Something inside of me said, get in the other lane. I got in the other lane, and I no sooner took that corner, there was a car on the wrong side of the highway in my high-speed lane and went right by me. I could have been killed if it wasn't for God's mercy. Let me tell you something. You cannot fool with the devil. You cannot fool with this carnal Christianity that's out there today that accepts everything and anything. And I was in that apartment... And my girlfriend turned to me. She noticed me over the last few weeks. She said to me, what's wrong with you? I said, nothing. A week would go by. She come to me, what's wrong with you? Come on, talk to me. What's wrong with you? I says, my heart's not right. She said, what do you mean? I said, my heart's not right with God. And she said this to me. She says, well, why don't you just get your heart right with God? And then these words came out of my mouth. I can't while you're still here. And I'm living with you. Are you hearing me? I can't do that while you're still here. A broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. Can I tell you the next day she packed up her stuff. She said, I'm leaving. Wouldn't give me an explanation. Just said, I'm leaving. She got an apartment or somewhere, got a job, and then she made enough money and went back to Pennsylvania. And I asked God one day, because I was broken. All alone. Broken. I said, God, why did she leave? He said, I sent her away. I sent her away. He loved me that much. He loved me that much to send her away. And I said this to him. I said, Lord, and this is the truth, what I'm telling you. I said, God, take me back fully, 100%, or let me go 100% back in the world. I cannot take this any longer. I can't take it, God. I can't take it. I can't take the drugs and the alcohol anymore. I can't take this lifestyle anymore because I've tasted and seen that the Lord was good. And when you taste and see that the Lord is good, you're like Peter when he said, Lord, 
Where else can I go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. Where can I go? Where can I go? I can't go. God, help me. Help me, God. Help me. And from that day on, can I tell you, from that day on, I was playing in the nightclubs. The Six Bristol Club, known as the 65 today. I went in there uh, with somebody for lunch one time, and I just looked over at the bandstand, and it's got the same bandstand where I set up my equipment. And I looked and I said, God, look where I am today, and look where I was. I said, I, I, and I was glad there was no ghosts. Come on, somebody. There was nothing there to attract me to say, go back. How can you go back to something when you've experienced something so, so much greater than what you had? And I said, God, take me back. And he took me back. And from that day forward till now, I've been serving him every single day. Hallelujah. I don't need to go back into the nightclubs. I don't need to go back back out there dancing and drinking and drugging. I don't need to do that anymore because I have Jesus and he's more than enough for me. Come on, somebody. So I'm going to close. Aren't you glad? I'm going to close with this. If you've got some giants that God's been speaking to you this morning, I don't care who you are. You know, one of the biggest giants people can get over is pride. And another giant is, what will people think? Get over that giant. Those are the giants that will stop you from the blessing. I told you last week and the week before that in Monday Night Prayer, we're restoring this altar. The churches today have lost it. They've lost the place of the altar. They no longer come down to the altar and seek God. Very few, and if you're in a church that does, praise God. But very few have the altar anymore. Know why? Because it's become an entertainment platform. I'm going to ask Pastor Tom, would you play that song, Psalm 23, again? And I want you to come forward. I, I'm telling you, there's deliverance in this place today. There's deliverance in this place. That you know there are some things that God convicted you. I don't even touch on it. But God convicted you while you're sitting right there in this place. God said it's time to slay Yesterday we had choir some of these giants. Sing it for real. Come on, help us sing this song. I want you to come up forward. I'm going to lay my hands on you. Lord is my shepherd. Oh, Rabba He goes before me. 